Bibles open or reopen them if you've closed them at uh, Hosea chapter 11. Um, we're going to be looking at that passage this evening. I'll be referring to it all the way through, so uh, you'll help find it helpful to have it in front of you. But uh, before we begin, uh, let's just pray once more together. Our gracious Father, we are grateful for your word, which continues to speak throughout the years and speaks to us tonight. We pray that you might send, as we've sung, your life-giving spirit to conquer our hearts and to bring us to Christ. Uh, work in us, we pray. Help us, we pray. Uh, turn us to him. Uh, increase our faith. Um, terrify of us of our sin that we might follow Christ in true devotion. And we pray these things in his good name. Amen. I remember as a, a child uh, watching the long-running TV program on the BBC called Food and Drink. I don't, know, I don't know if any of you remember it. And when I was small, one of my favorite segments of the show was the wine tasting. Uh, now, it wasn't because I was already a big wine fan by the age of eight, but uh, it was because I found the presenters so hilarious. Now, I'm not sure I've ever seen TV presenters so enthused by their subject. They'd grab a glass, they'd sniff deeply, they'd sip, they'd swell, and then they'd burst forth with this barrage of overblown metaphors and descriptions and flavors, and they'd be getting strawberries and kiwi fruit and chocolate and oak and just the hint of fresh cut grass on a warm Spanish summer evening. Now, they might have been overdoing it slightly, but they did have a point. You see, wine has a, a rich flavor. It's, uh, it's complex, and within that richness, you can taste various different flavors. And there's a sense in which, for Hosea, God's relationship with his people is a little bit like that. It's rich, and it's deep. And having already spoken of God's relationship with his people as a, a troubled marriage... In our passage this evening, Hosea says that it also has the flavor of a, a relationship between a father and his wayward son. And this evening, as God confronts and agonizes over his rebellious people through Hosea, he calls us to recognize the gravity of our sin and in his fatherly, steadfast love, he calls us to come home. I've got three points for you this evening. Uh, the first is this. Rejecting God's love is deeply offensive. Uh, verses 1 through 4. Now as the curtains open on our scene, we're, we're taken back in time, if you like, and we're greeted by what seems to be a, an idyllic sort of scene. Uh, verse 1, God looks back to the time of the Exodus, where he took his people he made them a nation in their own right. He adopted them as his son, his, his special child. And in a mighty act of redemption, he rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Uh, for Israel, this was the defining moment in their history. Uh, this rescue from Egypt was, it was at the heart of what it meant for them to be God's people. What it meant to be an Israelite. And God lovingly looks back and he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But these verses are no Werther's original advert with its soft focus camera angles and happy memories. Because God's tone is a, a mixture of deep affection, but also furious anger and personal hurt. You see, because in verse 2, God brings the charge that Israel actually has been far from the model child. And they've not simply been disobedient and in need of a visit from Channel 4's super nanny. They have been completely wayward, entirely rebellious. Verse 2, God says that the more, they called for, the more he called them, the further away they went. They cut their family ties, they burned their bridges... And they turned their back on him completely. Though God had adopted them as his child, 
Though he dramatically rescued them, they had sold him out. They'd gone to worship the Baals and they'd acted as if none of his salvation had happened. And the furious, tragic tone of a spurned and betrayed father carries on in verses 3 to 4. You see, although verses 1 to 4 in some ways act as a an accusation as a, an indictment of Israel's sin, and God charges them with unfaithfulness. Most of the verses are actually about what God has done for them. Eight times he hammers it home. Verse 1, I loved Israel. I called my son out of Egypt. Verse 2, I called Israel. Verse 3, I taught them to walk. I healed them. Verse 4, I led them. I lifted the yoke from their neck. I bent down to feed them. After he rescued them from Egypt, he was the one who taught them how they should live. He was the one who guided them as they went through the wilderness to the promised land. He was the one who fed them when there was no food or water in the desert. He was the one who met all their needs. He was the one who protected them and healed them when they were in distress. Like the best of fathers, he nurtured them, holding them securely under the arms as they took their first faltering steps. And verse 4, he says, he, he led them and fed them like the kindest of masters with an animal. And the point of all this really is to to contrast everything that God did with what Israel did. God had loved and rescued and nurtured. He'd fed, he'd healed. And yet here at Israel, turning away and sacrificing to the Baals. And when you hold Israel's rejection of God up against his persistent fatherly love, it's desperately ugly. It's deeply offensive. For God, it is hurtful in the worst of ways. When God had done so much for them, when he had loved them so deeply and cared for them so well, how could they, verse 2, turn their back on him and act, in fact, as if it was the Baals who had done all that for them? Verse 3, how could they not realize or not acknowledge that it was God who healed them? You see, as people loved by God, they're turning away from him. They're entrusting themselves to other things. It wasn't a sort of neutral choice that they had a a perfect right to. It wasn't just a case of getting a, a black mark in their divine copybook. It was a matter of deep, personal offense. Like an ungrateful teenage son sneering at all that his father has done for him. But this was about people 2,700 years ago. What on earth has it got to do with us tonight? Well, you see, actually, God hasn't changed. And his love is a reality that also we enjoy. As human beings, like Israel, we too are loved and provided for by God. Last week, we celebrated harvest at the time in the year when we remember that that in love God provides everything we need day after day, month after month, year after year. Each new day comes because he wills it. We sleep, we wake, we eat, we breathe, we spend because he gives us life and breath and food and income. He is the ultimate reason behind the dinner you ate earlier on, behind the friendships you treasure, behind the the tenor in your wallet. And as Christians, like Israel, we have a great heritage of his love and his salvation and his nurture. But tonight we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's the time when we remember God's great grace to us in Christ as he died on the cross for us and made us God's people. It's the time where he nurtures us to greater faith and assurance of his love. Tonight we are in a church where we are, where he feeds our souls and grows us to Christian maturity. 
And how easy is it to fail to give thanks? How easy it is to entrust ourselves to to other things, to seek security for life in pay packets and pensions, friendships and family members, and good health and personal strength. And how easy we find it to, to begin thinking that our sin isn't really that big a deal, and that actually our excuses really are that good. And for all intents and purposes, to begin thinking that we don't need Christ. Not necessarily in quite such a, a crass way as that. But in the sense that maybe, maybe repentance stops being such a, a regular part of our Christian experience. A regular feature of our lives. And, well, there are always good reasons for why we acted and thought and said things that we did. And possibly we begin to feel comfortable before God in the idea that actually, well, let's face it, we're pretty decent people. And Hosea calls us to beware thoughts like that and patterns of life like that. They are so easy to do, but Hosea calls them for what, exact, what they really are. Oppressively ugly. Heartrendingly ungrateful and hurtful. Profoundly offensive before the, heaven, the loving Heavenly Father who made us and feeds us and raised us and saved us. Our sin in this regard is intensely serious. We cannot afford to get comfortable and get used to relying on other things, to get used to relying on ourselves, to get used to, slowly but surely, turning away from God. Well, Hosea moves on, and my second point is this. Rejecting God's love is truly dangerous. Uh, Verses 5 through 7 uh, I mentioned it earlier, but uh, one, of, uh, one of the TV programs that Katie and I particularly enjoy when we come across it as we're flicking on the TV is Super Nanny. Uh, if you've not seen it, the premise is that uh, an expert in child development and child behavior is sent to a family who are having difficulty with their child's behavior. And uh, predictably, the, the program begins with a, a scene of chaos as the, the family is in complete disarray. And by the end, Super Nanny has swooshed in, unearthed the problems in the family, and uh, given the parents some helpful tips, and uh, everything looks like it's getting back on track. But the thing I find most interesting is that uh, one of the recurring problems seems to be that um, before Super Nanny comes, often the parents threaten punishment and discipline, but almost never follow through. But it is not so with God. He has warned Israel time and time again, and they will not listen. And verses 5 to 7, because of their waywardness and rejection of him, God says, punishment is coming. And it's no empty threat. And it would be a terrible judgment. God says that he's sending the the world superpower, Assyria, And they weren't known for strongly worded speeches in the UN or careful diplomacy, if you like. They were the most powerful empire in the world and they swept through the Middle East and they conquered and they enslaved. And there was no NATO, no war crimes tribunal at The Hague was going to hold them back. And verse 6, God says that his judgment through Assyria will be dreadful and violent Everything Israel was trusting in would just be torn apart. The sword would come, and thick city walls and sturdy city gates would be no protection. Both of them would come crashing down. And Israel and all their grand plans for the future would be devoured. And they'd be brought to nothing. And in verse 7, it's difficult to translate, so it's hard to know whether when God says they will call on the Most High, he means himself, or he's being sarcastic about their worship of Baal. But the end point is ultimately the same. If they cry out to Baal, he won't exalt them, 
Because in the face of the true God, who can? And if their cry is to God, he won't hear them. Either way, he says, there is no rescue from this judgment. But perhaps worst of all is verse 5. You see, when God mentions Egypt, he doesn't mean that they will actually go to Egypt. He means it in theological terms, if you like. It would be Assyria who actually came and conquered Israel. But part of the conquest would, be, would involve being taken out of the promised land and swept into exile. And this was really an undoing of all that God had done for them when he brought them out of Egypt at the Exodus, as we saw in verse 1. It was unraveling the whole thing. God had made them a nation. He'd made them a people. He'd led them to freedom. He had given them a, a land of their own. And these things were everything if you were an Israelite. And now, because of their rejection for, of him, God says he is about to put all of that through the shredder. They would return to Egypt in the sense that they would no longer be a nation in their own right. They would return to slavery. They would be kicked out of the promised land. And God would turn his face from them. Now often in the prophets, you find threats of punishment combined with, with calls to repentance. But not here. This judgment is given simply as a statement of fact. God says, this is coming, full stop. So why is that? Well, the reason lies with Israel. God had warned them. He'd appealed to them before, again and again. And the choice had been simple. Uh, there's a play on words in verse 5. Uh, slightly more literally, it says, Will they not return to Egypt because they refuse to return to me? They can return to God or they can return to Egypt. And Israel has made a settled choice. They must turn one way or the other. And verse 7, he says, they are determined to turn away from God. Uh, my uh, my in-laws have a, a little dog called Charlie. Now, Charlie is lots of fun. He's a little, uh, little white West Highland Terrier. But when he's taken out for a walk, his greatest joy is sniffing everything. Walls, lampposts, gates, the, the whole lot. And the thing with Charlie is that when he gets a good scent, he will not be moved. He's only a small dog, but when you tug on the lead to sort of move him on a bit, he sets his feet, he squares his shoulders, and he pulls in the direction that he wants to go with all the strength he's got. And when he starts to lose that battle, because predictably I've got a bit more weight than he has, he sits down and he makes himself as heavy as he possibly can. His mind is made up. He will not budge. And it's the same here with Israel. They've made their choice. And they're not budging. Verse 5, it says, they refuse to repent. Verse 7, they are determined to turn away from God. They are settled and absolutely sure in their choice. They haven't been taken in or fooled into following Baal. They're doing it willfully and persistently. And so God says things cannot continue as they are. They cannot presume to keep enjoying his blessings and love and goodness without acknowledging him. And so judgment is coming. Now, we're not ancient Israelites. Uh, I doubt any of us here this evening are Baal worshippers. The Assyrian Empire is long gone, long gone. But these things still matter for us. Because as we've already said, we, as Christians, or simply as human beings, we too are people loved, cared for, and provided for by God. And as we come to the New Testament, God says that a final day of reckoning is coming when we will be judged on the basis of our attitude to him. And a dreadful judgment awaits those who reject him. And so tonight Israel stand before us and warn us of, they warn us to beware of settling in 
to turning away from God. It can come in all sorts of forms. I mean, we can reject God and his love and want nothing to do with him in a a very obvious way, like, for example, a, a Richard Dawkins, perhaps. But it can be a lot more subtle and civilized than that. Beware of finding that you're not that concerned to struggle with temptation anymore. Beware of not really being bothered either way, whether you obey God or not. Be very careful of getting comfortable with living life on on your terms. Beware of one way or another, obviously or quietly, willfully and persistently turning away from God and giving your life to other things. Now, sin is a reality for all of us. We all struggle. We all go through ups and downs in our Christian walk. And if you are actively battling with sin, actively seeking God, this warning is not for you. But beware of being happy and settled and determined in life without God. Our passage this evening warns us that there are terrible consequences for us if we do. But even as the darkness of judgment falls in our passage, there's a ray of light. And this is my third point. God's love will have the last word. Verses 8 through 11. Now when it comes to national stereotypes, if there's anything the British, and I can say this as a Welshman, anything um, that the, the English are particularly known for, it's a great sense of personal reserve. And I have to say, for people not accustomed to public displays of emotion, I wonder if this chapter this evening might be possibly the most embarrassing in the Bible. Because in the midst of his fatherly sorrow and personal hurt and righteous fury, in verse 8, God himself bursts forth with a flood of raw emotion as he pours out his affection for his rebellious people. Even as he promises justice and judgment, he cries out, verse 8, How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Now, Admar and Zeboim were cities close to uh, the better better known ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Genesis 19, back at the time of Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah were known throughout the region for for their rampant evil and, and immorality and injustice. And in judgment, God brought destruction on the whole area and Sodom and Gomorrah and Admar and Zeboim were quite literally wiped off the face of the earth. And this is what Israel deserved. And yet the warmth of God's compassion for his people, rebellious and damaged and defiant though they are, turns his heart to them in mercy once again. His love and his compassion mean that that he cannot, he will not quit on his people and give them up. And verse 9, he says, I will not carry out my fierce anger. Now, that might present a bit of a difficulty, because actually in 722 BC, God did indeed send Assyria to the northern kingdom of Israel, and they were conquered, and they went into exile. So what on earth does he mean in verse 9? Well, I think given the the definiteness of the statements in verses 5 to 7, And the fact that actually when you get to verses 10 and 11, they talk about God's people returning from exile. Verse 9 doesn't mean that God is going to withdraw his punishment. Rather, he means that verses 5 to 7 will not be his last word for his people. They will not be obliterated and forgotten like Admar and Zeboim. He means that in his compassion... There is still hope for a people steeped in sin and degradation. Now, it's not that God is some, some 
weak-willed father who's wrapped around his child's little finger. It doesn't mean that he's prone to hormonal changes of mood. Rather, his compassion, his inextinguishable love for his people are at the heart of who, who he is. Verse 9, he says, he is not a human being, unpredictable, potentially vindictive. Rather, as in Exodus 34, where he proclaims his name to Moses, he is the God who is just and who does punish sin. But he is also compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And in his love and his compassion, there is hope for his people yet. And in verses 10 to 11, he looks to the future and he says that he will bring his chastened people back from exile to life again with him. In fact, he says, actually, it will be like the Exodus all over again. Because just as in verse 1, verse 10 literally says, sons will come. Out of Egypt he brought his son, and in verse 10, sons will come. And in verse 11, although they've been banished to Assyria, God speaks of their return as if it was being from uh, Egypt. Now, some, some Israelites did actually come back from exile eventually. Uh, you can read about it in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But things were never glorious like the prophets said they would be. And the people were still plagued by sin, and both books end on a, a flat note of disappointment. And really, you read them and you, well, you expect more. And so it's no surprise to find that Matthew connects Hosea's words to Jesus in that passage we had read for us. You see, Matthew represents Jesus to us as the, the true Son of God and who represents his people. And therefore, in his childhood journey out of Egypt, there was beginning God's exodus-like rescue. This second exodus, if you like, promised through Hosea. God's plan to bring his people back, to bring his compassion to full fruition, was about to start, and it began with Christ. And this means that actually this compassion this warmth, this love, this hope, this promise of hope in verses 8 to 11 have everything to do with us. Because in Christ we find that actually God's mercy extends beyond Israel to the whole world. And he reaches out to broken people, to rebellious people. He reaches out to turn our hearts to him, to rescue us from judgment, and to bring us ultimately to new life in him and with him. Have you ever looked at your life and wondered how much longer God is going to put up with you and all your struggles and failures? Have you ever dreaded stepping through the doors of the church on a Sunday morning? Felt like a complete fraud praying the prayers? Felt too guilty to sing? Have you ever been afraid that your sins might just be too big, too persistent this time for God to love you? Well, through Hosea, God bears his heart to us and it still beats for the guiltiest of us. And his love and his compassion ultimately expressed in Jesus Christ are there for our forgiveness, for our change, for a future. Now, we never have an excuse to go off and do whatever we want and think, well, you know, God will forgive, that's what he's like. His promises, his word to us means that we can be assured of his patience and grace and his commitment to us. His promises mean that we do not need to despair in our guilt and in our struggles with sin. Through faith in Christ, keep turning again to God in repentance and keep being assured of his love and his commitment to you. Keep praying for those friends for those family members who've maybe turned away from God or who want nothing to do with him. Because God's love flows out to the most undeserving of people. God's compassion stretches, stretches far beyond we, 
our expectations, and it is so much more determined than we can conceive. Rejecting God's love is deeply offensive to him. Willfully and persistently rejecting God carries a heavy penalty. It puts us in mortal danger. But in Christ, the passionate and relentless love of God our Father calls us again to come home. We're going to sing a song that I think, uh, in the light of Hosea's words, needs no, no introduction from me. We're going to stand together to sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And after that, we'll come to the Lord's Supper. Thank you.